while there's a whole lot of uh, slogans and quotes from the big book and other things in AA that, as you probably already guessed if you've been watching this channel, really irritate me, uh, the one I think that used to irritate me the most was the thing about we had to fearlessly face the proposition that God was everything or he was nothing, that either God is or he isn't. Uh, and that that ultimatum and that the way that was always dictated and quoted in meetings always angered me to no end. And uh, it... It, it's funny to me because in AA they never give you a, a clear definition of what God is uh, outside of the fact that God wants you not to drink and do steps and stay in meetings. That seem to be the only guidelines for the higher power as you understand it. They'll say a higher power as you understand it, but any higher power that you have in AA, uh, it has to correlate with the AA program. You can't come into AA and say, well, the so-called uh, higher power that I've discovered or the the... Uh, philosophical, I guess you could say, conjectures that I've come to the conclusion of. I don't need to sit in meetings and say I'm powerless or I'm, you know, I need to do step work and moral inventories and all that other kind of thing. Then you would be told that that was your alcoholic thinking. In other words, when they say you can have any higher power you want, uh, it means any higher power that lines up with AA's stuff, more or less. But the reason uh, that I started to make this particular video, because I've attacked we agnostics on here multiple times, I've never given it the attention that I, it needs because the chapter is just really uh, nothing more than a bunch of pleading uh, for you to accept Bill W's religion. And if you don't accept it, uh, he calls you closed-minded and he calls you prejudiced and he calls you ignorant and every kind of other thing. That, that whole entire chapter used to make me really angry. Uh, in spite of the fact most of the AA literature actually makes me angry now if I look at it or read it I don't make it a habit to ever do that again I haven't ever picked up an actual uh, big book outside of the outside of just trying to make a video topic I haven't actually read any AA literature since leaving <coughs> but uh, I encountered this uh, BBC play from 1959 the other day on the other evening on YouTube uh, called Branded, and it was uh, a, it was based upon a, a play by uh, the writer Henrik Ibsen. I hope I'm saying that name correctly, but uh, it was uh, concerning uh, a person who actually takes the idea that God is everything or he's nothing, is or isn't, to the extreme. And uh, for some reason, it, I thought it, it, it was worth making a video over. Uh, the film is, is, like I said, it's on YouTube, but before I say anything, before you go look for it or anything like that, it's not a film in the usual sense, and it's not really a stage play in the usual sense. It's a dialogue-driven <clears throat> play, uh, and it's mainly a bunch of arguments, and you got, uh, it was the, it was a lead role given to Patrick McGowan, and uh, I, I understood, according to what I read about him online, that it was something that was very personal to him. Patrick McGowan was one of those actors I always admired uh, due to the intensity he brought to his roles, like the Prisoner series, I think was one of the best TV series ever done. And he did mention a lot of the times about the struggle with the individual against, you know, the bureaucracy or against the cult religion or whatever. You know, I said cult religion because I did an AA video about it. As a person, I don't think I would have gotten along with him at all. I, I think he would have probably disliked me immensely. Uh, it, it, because, uh, for example, I left the Catholic Church. He was a staunch Catholic. He had puritanical views about sex that I do not have whatsoever. I mean, he <clears throat> uh, he refused to act in films where he was going to kiss other actresses. Uh, he refused to do James Bond one time because of moral innuendos, those types of things. He had a lot of demons within him as far as drinking alcohol and other things, but... He always did bring a, 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 a lurking intensity. It was almost like he was just about to go off the deep end in a lot of the roles I saw him in. But in this one, he doesn't hold back at all. He plays, he plays the part of a priest who has this idea and his vision of what God is. Because I, and then that, that's what made me actually decide to do the video. Because his version of what God is... Is, is a lot of pain and suffering. Uh, a lot of his ranting and raving throughout the play, he talks about, you know, when Jesus uh, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the God didn't take away uh, his fears, and the Garden of Gethsemane was summed up in the Rolling Stones song where Jesus Christ has his moment of doubt and pain. 
<clears throat> and uh, throughout the entire play, with a whole lot of dialogue and things going on, he urges everybody to renounce everything they, they've got, or even their own, at the cost of their own life. Uh, as a matter of fact, he says men or mankind clings to their life, even if they've lost everything. And he views this as abhorrent. He, he, he views it as a sin, ultimately. Uh, he thinks you should be willing to give up your life because your soul is a lot more important than your personal life, is the way he, he takes it. And like I said, if you look it up, it would require a lot of patience to sit through because it is a lot of shouting, it is a lot of rhetoric, it is a lot of arguing, it is a lot of philosophical stuff involved in it. Uh, but ultimately, it's his own downfall uh, due to his extremism and the fact that he becomes very monstrous as a person uh, due to his extremism. Uh, he refuses to see his dying mother because she won't renounce all the worldly possessions and go to the grave as a beggar. Uh, so he refuses to comfort her in her last hours. Uh, when his child dies, even though it's by the advice of villagers, his wife and everyone else, that he should leave uh, the mountain village where he lives in because the climate's intolerable and his kid has obviously is dying from what I, I'm going to deduce from the film. It was like pneumonia or something like that. He refuses to do that. And when his child dies, he actually says his child was a temptation placed in his path. Uh, by God, he views his child as an idol is how he uh, twisted around in his philosophy. And he refuses to allow his wife to hang on to any of the possessions of his child uh, for sentimental value because he says you either give God everything or you give God nothing. Uh, he says over and over again, he reiterates it throughout the entire play, that if you're not willing to give up everything that's even comfortable to you or anything that's even remotely good to you, then uh, you are de you're damned to hell, uh, more or less in his extremism. Uh, later on, when his wife dies, he refuses to even see that it's in part due to his own cruelty, it's all due to his own neglect. He just sees this as another obstacle that he must not have any compassion for, that he must not have any feelings for, uh, because after all, he's in his own uh, fanatic view of the world, if you're not in pain and you're not suffering and you're not giving up every good pleasure that you've got, you're unworthy. And... Uh, Later on, I mean, I, I'm skipping through a lot here because there's a lot of arguing with the mayor about the churches. He wants to burn the churches down at one point. He wants to build the churches at another point. Later on, at the end, when everything finally falls apart, all that is left is him and his insanity, and he's at the point of dying. Uh, it ends a little differently in the BBC play versus uh, the actual Ibsen play. I looked it up. Where at the end, at the moment of his death, he says, you know, can he not be given a sign? Can he not be shown something uh, to prove that he was right all along? And he's given, it ends on an enigmatic note. Uh, in the original play, he hears the voice that say, God is a God of charity. In the BBC <clears throat> version of it, uh, he says that uh, the voice tells him that God is a God of love, which now, to be honest, uh, from my own memories, I guess you could say, of growing up Catholic, I didn't find God very loving, to be honest. And I lived in mortal terror of God. Uh, you know, I believed that I was being watched. I believed that even sinful thoughts was going to get me in a lot of trouble. It, it gave me a lot of mental problems. Uh, and I, it, it wasn't because of necessarily something bad happening to me in religion that caused me to walk away from it. It was just uh, when I got a little older and when I was kind of on my own, I just realized I was not feeling any uh, uh, attraction or any connection to what I was finding within the church itself. So when it says God of love, uh, I color me skeptic on that. But I think the overall message that I got out of it, because, you know, it threw out the entire play, the theme, even though it's challenged by various characters who have dialogue with him. Uh, the, the theme is ultimately is that you have to give everything over to God, but at the same time, if, you know, you're doing it through cruelty and pain and inflicting suffering upon others, then you're not actually giving yourself over to a God because God is supposedly a God of love. And it brings me back to the original premise that I used to get in AA all the time. They would arrogantly proclaim this at a lot of meetings. I used to inwardly groan when I would hear that the topic was going to be from we agnostics. I was like, oh my God, here we go again with more of this shit. 
<laughs> but it, it would they and ultimately they would say that whole thing either God is or isn't. Okay, well, you're making a grandiose sweeping statement without any definition whatsoever because I never saw anyone in AA that was an old timer that was a guru uh, practice anything close to what I would call spiritual principles or what I guess what I would think of as spiritual principles. They would. Uh, mainly what I saw uh, the old timers at large and those who would become eventually brainwashed by the AA thing, the AA cult religion to be, were very, very cruel in their delivery of everything. They seemed to look down upon people who relapsed. They seemed to show zero compassion for people who committed suicide. Uh, they seemed to show zero anything really outside of just a desire to sit in meetings and feed their own freaking egos by bragging about how humble they were. So, and... I never had the vocabulary necessary to express what that would, would do to me when I'd hear them say, well, either God is or he isn't. Uh, but over time, I've been able to actually see that, that the reason that was irritating me is because you're just emphatically making a statement without any kind of substantial background as to what this statement is supposed to mean. And you're not doing anything that I see other than uh, glorifying your own self by talking about how spiritual you are and you're judging how spiritual spiritual you are by how long you've been without a drink. Uh, you know, that was a, a standard that it, it confused me many times over the years in AA with uh, this notion that I would see people engaged in the most abhorrent of behaviors and the most hypocritical of actions and the most rotten cruelty uh, that I've ever seen. I saw more humane people when I was locked up in jail than I did some of the AA people that would literally sneer at someone who was dying drunk, that would literally look down upon someone uh, who had committed suicide. They would say in meetings, some have to die so that others can live. I've talked about that in other videos before. And you're telling me that this is spiritual. You're telling me that this is what I should aspire to be. You're telling me that God is everything or he's nothing. And this is the example you're showing to me is, is really nothing. I mean, when you really sound it all down, there's no concrete anything in AA except you blindly accept the dogma. You, pri you blindly uh, repeat the slogans and the cliches. Uh, you find yourself... Uh, if you could get enough time under your belt to be some kind of honorary statesman that thinks you're above everybody else because you've got a medallion that says you've got so many years without a drink. Uh, and I think uh, to tie into what I was watching with Brand, uh, he's got the idea that to give God everything is to, is to accept pain and suffering and to be wantonly cruel to everybody who doesn't accept his own view of it. Now, strangely enough, uh, having grown up with conflict in religion, uh, even from the, because I was, I, I believe it or not, I'm one of these people that actually took the church very seriously. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily believe that if you knew my entire background, uh, as far as my adult background. Uh, you, a lot of people have accused me without even knowing anything about me. Well, you turned your back on the church because you wanted to drink and because you want to do drugs and because you want... That's actually not true at all. I took the church very, very seriously when I was a young person, when I was a kid. Uh, I took the concepts of it all seriously. I went to confessions. I mean, I did all that, uh, all that kind of stuff. Now, I know some people differ about the Catholic view, viewpoint uh, as not being really a Christian viewpoint, but I took the idea of God in the Bible very, very seriously. And it did give me hang-ups and, and complexes about suffering being the right thing to experience and pleasure being the wrong thing to experience. It gave me uh, major hang-ups uh, that AA, I think it's one of the reasons why I didn't 100% ever completely fall into the AA trap because I had already walked away from a strict dogmatist religion and I wasn't about to get necessarily sucked into another one, even though I got sucked into it a lot more than I would like to admit uh, because I did do the steps. I did read the big book. I did have sponsors. I did do all those things and none of it, none of it uh, stopped me from drinking at all. And this is going to sound like a strange thing to say. I'm rather glad it didn't help me stop drinking because during the times that I was sober in AA, like my very first year in AA, when I was really, really taking it seriously, when I was not drinking alcohol, I was a neurotic mess. Okay, I was miserable all the time about all these mental hangups and all these inventories and all of this stuff and things that sponsors were telling me. Uh, <clears throat> 
in fact, I, I actually wanted to do another video topic, and I will as soon as I get another chance, about uh, mental health misdiagnoses, because, well, if I started talking about that, I'd get into the subject of another video and lose topic of this one. But, uh, yeah, I'm actually glad AA never helped me stop drinking. I'm actually glad that I went through all the relapses I went through in AA, because had I not had to pick up a bunch of white chips, well, I didn't have to. I did because I thought I was supposed to. Uh, if I hadn't had picked up a bunch of white chips, and if I hadn't have gone through the the absolutely horrible people that I met as a result of picking up a white chip, you know, you, you say you drank again in AA, and you might as well say you committed rape and murder, because uh, <coughs> that's really the only crime in AA. You could be the worst sexual predator or whatever. Uh, you could be, like some people I knew that bragged about uh, a sexual assault, that bragged about... Uh, abusing their spouses and bragged about all kinds of terrible things and they blamed all of that on uh, well i'm an alcoholic after all uh none of that even seemed to carry any weight uh with the overall group of aa the overall morality of aa is just how long has it been since you've had a drink you could be the most upright honest person and i'm not saying that i'm some kind of moral puritan that i'm some kind of goody two-shoe or any of that kind of shit I'm, but i'm saying that I just used to find it really strange that how spiritual you were was judged upon how long you'd been without a drink. Uh, and that was the only, uh, I guess for want of a better term, that was the only moral compass you were measured by in AA. You could even be actively involved in criminal activity. And if you hadn't had a drink in a long time, somehow or the other, that was, that was all was forgiven. Which, you know, that used to actually kind of crack me up that there were all these people that I would see in these AA meetings and they would talk about uh, how they were liars, uh, how they would lie to you in a heartbeat, how they would just make up anything if they had to in a heartbeat. They would openly admit to being liars. They would openly admit to being thieves, but then they would expect me to believe them when they said they hadn't had a drink in, you know, decades. I mean, you've admitted to me you're a liar. You've admitted to me you're dishonest, but I'm supposed to 100% believe you now because you say you haven't had a drink. It, it, or the people I would hear that would tell the fantastic stories about what they did when they were drunk. And I mean, I'm going to give you the most extreme examples right here to paint a picture. Uh, there was a guy who said he tried to commit suicide by jumping off a building and then he fell five stories and he, he landed and he just got up and dusted himself off and he went and got him another drink. Okay, not, not possible. Uh, or another guy I knew that said he drank Lysol one time in an attempt to commit suicide and he just woke up the next morning and realized he had to go to work and he had to go get a drink before work. If you're making up these kinds of bullshit stories but and you want me to believe you're telling me the truth about your sobriety, I mean, you know... To rip off the old cliche, it didn't fall off the vodka truck yesterday. I mean, it, it just used to crack me up how I would catch people in lies, not actually catch them as far as, you know, me calling them out or something like that, but I would hear something that I knew wasn't true, or I would see something that I knew uh, was bullshit as far as what the, these people were saying in these meetings and all this other kind of stuff, but they expected me to believe that they were being 100% honest about not taking a drink. <laughs> I don't, you know... Talk about, you know, talk about cognitive dissonance. It wasn't obvious to me until after I left AA and out and got out from underneath the world of brainwashing that I was actually able to look at that and say, wait a minute, I trusted these people? I mean, what the hell was wrong with me? I felt like even slapping myself for being so fucking stupid or so desperate. I'm going to change that because so desperate to need to believe in something that you kind of see what you want to see. But... Yeah, I mean, uh, God's everything or he's nothing, okay? That depends upon your interpretation of what God is, if you even believe in something like that. And just to make a grandiose sweeping statement like that doesn't actually prove or anything. I mean, to quote Nietzsche, a casual stroll through a lunatic asylum doesn't prove anything. As the protagonist of our BBC play brand found out, unfortunately, for himself, his fanaticism, his dedication, his... Uh, desire to inflict cruelty all around him and pain and suffering upon himself uh, for a divine reward it turned out to be rather frugal, right, not frugal, futile, futile, what the hell's wrong with me, frugal, frugal, <laughs> anyway, um, that I guess pretty much sums up what this whole entire, uh, what I was going to say for this particular video, and like I said, what I wanted to talk about was 
mental health diagnosis is in the next one if I if I get a chance to do this again this week. Um, and anyway, until next time.